Well, good morning. Welcome to Pyjama Preaching for Friday, the 27th of November. And uh, we're reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 13 to 17. And today, for a change, I'm using the New Revised Standard Version. <coughs> then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the empire or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius, let me see it. And they brought one. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Jesus said to them, Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. Find my piece of paper. I'm leaning very heavily on William Barclay today because having read his commentary of the passage, there's an awful lot of interesting history behind it that will make sense when I, when I tell you in the context of the passage. So Barclay says there is a history behind this shrewd question, and it's a bitter history. Herod the Great ruled all of Palestine as a Roman tributary king. He had been loyal to the Romans and they respected him and had given him a great deal of freedom. When he died in 4 BC, he divided his kingdom into three. To Herod Antipas, he gave Galilee and Perea. To Herod Philip, he gave the wild district up in the northeast around Trachonitis, Iturea and Abilene. To Archelaus, he gave the south country, including Judea and Samaria. Antipas and Philip soon settled in and on the whole ruled wisely and well. But Archelaus was a complete failure. The result was that in AD 6, the Romans had to step in and introduce direct rule. Things were so unsatisfactory that southern Palestine could no longer be left as a semi-independent tributary kingdom. It had to become a province governed by a procurator. Roman provinces fell into two classes. Those which were peaceful and required no troops, and they were governed by the Senate and ruled by the proconsuls. Those which were trouble centres and required troops were the direct sphere of the emperor and were governed by procurators. Southern Palestine fell naturally into the second category, and tribute was in fact paid direct to the emperor. The first act of the governor Cyrenius was to take a census of the country in order that he might make proper provision for fair taxation and general administration. The calmer section of the people accepted this as an inevitable necessity. But one Judas the Gaulanite raised violent opposition. He thundered that taxation was no better than an introduction to slavery. He called on the people to rise and said that God would favour them only if they resorted to all the violence that they could muster. He took the high ground that for the Jews, God was the only ruler. The Romans dealt with Judas with their customary efficiency, but his battle cry never died out. No tribute to the Romans, came a rallying cry of the more fanatical Jewish patriots. There were three taxes, a ground tax, an income tax and a poll tax. And so everybody had to pay simply for the privilege of existing, really. And so the question that the Pharisees and the Herodians put to Jesus, like before, was, was really clever. Again, it was them trying to impale him on the, the horns of a dilemma. Because if he said that it wasn't lawful to pay tribute, then they could report him to the Romans and have him arrested as a revolutionary. They must have been sure that Jesus had in a trap from which there was no escape. That thought had got you. But Jesus said, show me a denarius. And thinking about it, he asked him to show him one. He didn't have one himself. 
I didn't have one myself, I had to Google a picture of one. So there is an image of a denarius. And he asked them whose image was on it, and the image would be that of Tiberius, the reigning emperor. All the emperors were called Caesar. Round the coin there would be a title which declared that this was the coin of Tiberius Caesar, the divine Augustus, son of Augustus, and on the reverse might be the title Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of the Roman nation. Now coinage was a sign of power. And where the coin was valid, the king's power held good. So the king's sway was measurable by the area in which his coins were recognised as valued currency. So because the coin had the king's head and the king's inscription on it, it was held, at least in some way, to be the king's personal property. Therefore, Jesus' answer was very clever. By using the Tiberius coinage, you in fact recognise his political power in Palestine. Apart altogether from that, the coinage is his own because it has his name on it. By giving it to him, you're giving him what is in event his own. So give it to him, but remember there is a sphere in life which belongs to God, not to Caesar. So Jesus again thwarts the uh, scribes and the Pharisees. And again, frustrated, but they, they go away. But as we see, the build-up is coming. We know far more of the story. But we realise that the, the state is ordained by God. And we believe in Jesus. And so next time you have a coin in your hand, just remind yourself of these battles of words that Jesus had with the religious authorities of his time. The way that they were trying to entrap him. The way that the people looked to him to be their rescuer. But how things change as we read the remaining passages in Mark's Gospel over the next month or so. So we just pray that, thank you, Lord, that we are made in your image. We need no coin to make us special, because in your eyes, each and every one of us is. Amen. Have a good Friday. God bless you. And sorry this has run on a little bit longer, but I was getting a bit carried away with Barclay's commentary and how it flowed, so... Sorry about that.